All right, let's get started then. Um, so I'm Letitia LaFollette, the president of the AIA, and I am delighted to uh, welcome you to our last of nine Archaeology Abridged. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Martin Carver, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Archaeology at the University of York in the UK. Uh, as many of you know, he gave us a fabulous talk on Sutton Hoo on May 13th, and we are excited to welcome him back for a second one that will give us some context on the finds at this incredible Anglo-Saxon site in Southwest England. I also had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Carver about his work a few months ago, soon after the Netflix movie came out that has revived interest in the archeological discoveries at Sutton Hoo. The movie of course is The Dig with Ray Fiennes and Carey Mulligan about the rediscovery of the site in the late 1930s, right before the Second World War. And if you haven't seen it yet, I do recommend it. Um, but we're getting the real, less Hollywoodized story from Dr. Carver. Um, and if you're interested in my interview, it's available on the AIA's YouTube channel. Um, we will put the link in the chat. So let me tell you about our speaker. Dr. Martin Carver was a British army officer for 15 years, then a freelance archeologist for 12 and an academic for 22. He holds degrees in math, chemistry and Anglo-Saxon studies. Dr. Carver specializes in archeological practice and proto-historic Europe having led archeological projects in Algeria, England and Scotland, Southern France, Italy, and now Sicily. He's the author of many books and articles, but most relevant for us today is his 2017 paperback, The Sutton Who Story, Encounters with Early England. The book is based on his excavations at Sutton Who from 1983 to 2005. Today, Dr. Carver will give us his interpretation, his reinterpretation, of the amazing finds at Sutton Hoo. He'll focus on the people behind the great ship burials, what they might've been thinking, and the connections they had to peoples in other places like Scandinavia, Europe, and the Mediterranean. He'll also update us on the latest research on the site, including the reconstruction of the great ship itself. And he would very much like your reactions to that. Um, this is an example of experiential archeology span um, and uh, we'll, we hope that you will actually respond in the uh, Q&A section um, to what he presents at the very end about that. But before I turn it over to Dr. Carver, let me mention, as I said at the beginning, that this is the last of nine archeology span abridged talks that the Archeological Institute of America put on this year. Eight of them, all but the first, were recorded and are accessible on the AIA's website that you accessed or got to, um, to register for this talk. Um, now, like all nonprofits, the AIA has been hard hit by the pandemic. If you enjoyed this program, I hope you will consider contributing something to help us continue the work that we do, um, and particularly this type of public programming. The text to donate link will be in the chat. It's also actually visible on the screen right now um, at the bottom of the screen on the right. And we'll also post this at the end of the program. Like public radio, for those of you in the United States, talks like these are only sustainable if they are supported by the public. And of course, that public is you. Thank you. And take it away, Martin. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Is, is that a success? Can everybody see it? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Thank yes, you very much. Well, greetings, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me, Leticia, and the Institute. <clears throat> this is actually the second of two talks. <clears throat> However, I've done my best to make it stand alone because not everybody will have had the chance to, to hear the first one. Um, first one was really the story of how the site was discovered and uh, the burials and and uh, how they were re-examined in a <coughs> in a in a big uh, uh, campaign which ended in, in 2005 with the publication so what I wanted to do today was to share with you some of the work that's happened since then and some of the work that is actually happening now uh, it's to it's to say like many a 
many of the great sites in um, your country as well as ours, that the site itself is a point of departure for all sorts of new research. It, it tends to generate questions and people then chase those questions as and when they can. So the site itself is in, the, in East Anglia, in the southeast part of Britain. Um, it belongs to a kind of North Sea community of kingdoms marked on this map and some in the channel as well. Uh, we believe that the contacts between all these little kingdoms that were forming in the 6th, 7th century were quite good. Uh, they seem to have exchanged artifacts and uh, we know something about um, how they traveled across the sea, but not nearly as much as we would like. Well, the interpretations <clears throat> of Sutton Hoo started in a traditional way by aligning them with the history that existed, which was pretty thin. Uh, there, there, are, there is the Venerable Bede, who was um, obviously a very fine historian, wrote the English history of the English church and people. Uh, but um, he wasn't that well informed on East Anglia. He, he worked in Northumbria. And we are reliant on archaeology to a great extent to try and understand what happened in East Anglia. But uh, there is an East Anglian king list which gives the dates of the death of the different rulers. And so one way of looking at this site with its burial mounds, including the great ship burial, is to just uh, put some of these kings in the mound notionally. We obviously don't know which is which. Uh, I think some we feel reasonably confident about. Uh, Redwald himself was such an important figure um, that he almost certainly is the person who was buried in Mound One. Um, his father was Waffa, who's probably the earliest mound we've got. His father was Waha. And then uh, Tutla was the, uh, um, well, sorry, Waffa was Redwald's grandfather. Tutla was his father. And then the second uh, uh, group of um, kings came from uh, brother Aini, who died in 610. I think that these are all very notional, but the point is about this site is that it's definitely a special group of mounds separate from the normal run of Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, be they cremations or inhumations. Two things I want to point out. One is Mound 14, uh, which I boldly said there is Redwell's Queen, uh, for which the evidence is slight, uh, but um, attempting. And the execution victims of the Christian kings are in the 700 to 1000, the 8th to the 10th century. Uh, so it's a site which has a, a story, not simply a single episode in history. <clears throat> this is the story that is, um, has been uh, elucidated from our excavations and from others. The earliest is a sixth century family cemetery. Uh, then there's a princely cemetery with uh, uh, likely to be the royal burial ground. Uh, it ceased in sometime in the middle of the um, seventh century. And by the early eighth century, it had, had become a place of execution. And in the 12th century, the place of execution moved. These, these gallows, these places of execution are placed on thoroughfares of different kinds, uh, trackways, and in the case of the 12th century, uh, by the main ford over the river at Wilford Bridge. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the interpretation model is of an Anglian family cemetery in the 500 to 590, then an, a pagan chiefdom, 590 to 600, a kingdom in transition, 600 to 750, and then the Anglian Christian kingdom, which doesn't use the pagan burial ground anymore for burying its kings. So this is like a kind of state formation model, if you like. Well, moving on then to the next period of research from the middle of the 
uh, from the 2005 when the publication came out uh, after that. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you from one line of research to another. So I've flagged up these lines of research to show what we're after in each case. Um, on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see a map of Britain with a lot of symbols on. Now, those symbols all relate to monumental mounds of different types, horse burial, boat burial, and most importantly, bed burial. So that marks out their distribution. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the kingdoms are vaguely placed where they probably were. The Anglo-Saxon, that's the English kingdoms uh, on the southeast part of the island, Pictish in the north and uh, British in the west and northwest. So it's an island that has got a number of different peoples and those peoples are manifesting their kingdoms that they're forming in different ways. With the Anglo-Saxons, it's the building of monumental burial mounds. And with the British, it's more uh, done with sculpture as I, as I shall show. The mounds are divided into two important phases. From 590 to 640, they're mainly warrior mounds, like Sutton Hoo, Mound 1 and 2. But from 640 to seven, uh, 675, they are nearly all female who's been, females who've been buried. And from, for want of a better term, I call them landowner mounds. These mounds with women in, high status women, uh, tend to be placed in prominent parts of the landscape overlooking land. And the interpretation that's been given them by the researches of Helena Hamro at Oxford are that these women are, if you like, the connection of inheritance between one uh, generation and the next. Uh, if you like, a piece of land claiming, uh, which is, is as good as a document. So, uh, the line of, next line of research is on East, the East Anglian Kingdom itself. So on the left, there's a map of East Anglia. Um, Sutton Hoo is in the bottom right. Uh, <clears throat> there's a little area here of small rivers, uh, which I've named the Sandlings Province. It's, it's called the Sandlings, this area anyway. Uh, but it's slightly separated from the northern part of, of um, Suffolk and from the Fen area and from Norfolk. The type of research that's been done here, there's a very large amount of research which has been done from field walking, usually by the commercial, uh, commercial firms. Uh, and we also have a thing called the Portable Antiquity Scheme, uh, where finds in the um, soil that are found by treasure hunters with metal detectors uh, are handed in, recorded and plotted. So basically what happened was that the, the law um, of, against metal detecting was eased to allow it, uh, provided people were honest enough to declare what they'd found. And as a result, there are an astonishing number of fines, mainly of precious metal and bronze, uh, were, were declared. It's now in the hundreds of thousands. And no area of Britain is richer in these fines than Norfolk and Suffolk. In Suffolk also, we have the port of Ipswich. It had a pottery um, industry, Ipswich ware, and the finds of Ipswich ware plot out what you might call the likely locus of the kingdom of East Anglia. So all this is work in progress uh, and uh, the finds come up every year and enrich our map. Among these places, uh, I suppose the most important is Rendlesham. I marked it on the map there. It's very close to Sutton Hoo. It occurs in Bede's history. Um, Rendlesham was the uh, site of probably a, a, a palace or, a, or, or a, a country seat, as the translation has it, of Redwald. Um, Switham, King of the East Saxons, was baptized there in 662. Well, after a long pause, 
between the publication of Bruce Mitford, who fingered uh, Rendlesham as a really important place and probably the palace that went with the burial ground, um, it started to be investigated. Now it's under investigation, thanks to the loan, landowner who, who has come to terms with archaeologists um, uh, on his land. And uh, the investigations are led by Chris Skull and uh, by the Suffolk County Council archaeologists. It's extraordinarily rich. It's produced an enormous number of finds, uh, coins and elite metalwork dating from the 6th to the 8th century. It has a, a standing, ch uh, standing church, which is um, the Church of St. Gregory. And you can see on the map, by, it's by the River Deben and the areas of activity are, are mapped out there, uh, showing the... Um, the river shows that the uh, arrow shows where Sutton Hoo is. So basically it's upstream from Sutton Hoo. Martin, can I stop you for a second and ask you if you can make your volume a little louder? Some people are yep, having certainly. a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry you can't hear me. Let's just that, try. That would be great. Thank uh, you. Um, uh, hang on a minute. I've got to, I've got to escape, haven't I? And find it. Is that louder? Um, we'll keep on going and we'll, we'll be able to tell. You have to say some more words. All right. Well, I, hope, I hope that's a little better. Yes, um, I think it is actually. And the closer you stay to the screen, the, be okay. the louder stay, you will be. I'll stay close okay. to the screen then. Hang okay. On. I'm Thank now you. sharing yeah. um, and uh, play from current slide. Is that working? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you. So we were at Rendlesham. This is a very important project. It's been very um, productive. Uh, it's an unusual kind of site. Is it a palace? It probably will be. At the moment, it looks a little bit like one of those uh, trading settlements where people drop metal all over the place. And the whole idea of these portable antiquities is, is that they have quite a lot of material from the sort of metal that falls off a horse when you're galloping along. And so it tells us something about the way the land was used. Uh, Next line of research is to connect <coughs> the world of Sutton Hoo with the Britons. So as you can see in the map on the left, we know about kingdoms in Dalrieda with the Scots, Pictland for the Picts, Scotothin is uh, uh, British, Northumbria is sort of semi-British, semi-English, and then these are the English kingdoms here. Uh, this picture I think epitomizes what might be going on in the 6th, 7th century. Uh, you can see um, on the right hand side the Sutton Hoo Mound 17 bridle with its strap ends and the bridle bit there. Uh, and then the roundels, the decorated roundels. And these decorated roundels uh, show up all over the island. So here in Del Riada, there's one, here in uh, Motor Mark, there's another. And there's one come from the site of Port Mahomet in Pickland, which uh, I excavated and has a, a, an 8th century monastery in it, as well as a 7th century elite settlement. So uh, as a, a piece of speculation, it would seem that there is an equestrian class which shares the same kind of symbolism in Britain at that time. Of course, uh, once these kingdoms got up and running, they started to attack each other. <clears throat> so the next line of um, the next line of research is the Warring Kingdoms. Uh, the map on the left shows some of the battle sites: um, Chester, Hatfield, uh, the Meserfeld, Winward, all mentioned by Bede. And uh, uh, we have a discovery of the Staffordshire Horde, which um, happened a few years back. Uh, and it, it's now fully published, just last year it's been fully published. Uh, it's an extraordinary find by a metal detectorist, uh, contained 74 sword pommels, 107 hilt collars, guard plates, sword pyramids and buttons, helmet parts, and crosses, Christian crosses as well. They're all bullion, so all the iron has been taken out, and we're left with 4,520 uh, 4, fragments, 3.9 kilometers, sorry, 
3.9 kilograms of gold, uh, uh, 1.7 kilograms of silver. And the thing was valued at three million pounds uh, when it went to the treasure trove panel. Well, a lot of discussion about what this hoard might have meant. And uh, in fact, the big monograph that was, um, was published last year didn't really come to a conclusion. It sort of left a lot of ideas open. And um, uh, that's as it should be. Uh, but it doesn't stop some of us having a good old guess as to what it what, what this was about. Uh, it was all found together um, uh, uh, quite near a, um, a, a former tree pit in the middle of a field, uh, miles from anywhere on agricultural land, but quite close to the A5, which is basically a, a Roman road called Watling Street. That star on the map shows where this hoard was, was found. And it obviously consists of a great deal of material that's been gathered together. Um, it looks as though the aristocracy and the church have, co have uh, contributed to this. Well, if we want to try and find a context, <clears throat> as usual, we go to Bede and Bede says that Penda was in the habit of attacking both Northumbria and East Anglia. Uh, there was a state of war between them. Penda was king between 626 uh, and 655 in Mercia. And um, he at one stage uh, was, was bought off or there was an attempt to buy him off by Edwin of Northumbria. Uh, an incredible uh, treasure was offered, but this treasure was uh, refused. And so they went to war and eventually Appenda was defeated. So to try and find a context, um, the uh, a possibility is uh, argued like this. Uh, 3.9 kilograms of gold, 1.7 kilograms of silver. Let's call that 4.5 kilograms of gold altogether. That's equivalent to 100 mancus, which is 30,000 pence or 500 oxen is a king's ransom. So it does seem to me that this could even be that treasure, but it certainly does seem to be bullion used to pay somebody off. Well, the uh, next um, line of research is about these female burials. I also, also already mentioned um, the work of uh, Helena Hamero, published in 2016, brilliant article in the European Journal of Archaeology, uh, which explains these burials, uh, which are on the map on the left-hand side here. Uh, each of them was a, a burial of a woman, and um, each of them had a bed in it as well. Sutton who had its own version of this, um, which I touched on last time, uh, a mound 14, uh, it had a couch, uh, there was a tomb robber's trench, which, uh, which unfortunately mucked the thing up uh, a lot. Um, it, it seems to have been dug in a, ra a rainstorm and there was a sort of mush at the bottom and uh, a lot of little tiny bits were retrieved from that, including the uh, upholstery nails from the couch, but on the whole, you know, it was a, a ransacked. Uh, that's a reconstruction on the right hand side there of, of the um, um, of, of the of the set of a sort of symbolic key, which are carried by uh, an important woman. And there's a reconstruction by Penelope Walton Rogers uh, of some of the textiles, this decorated sleeve with a tabby weave. Uh, so uh, we at Sutton who had one of these female burials quite up, up market. Uh, it seems to be around about 650, so it's in the right date. And I'm just going to show you three more because I know this is a, an area of interest at Swallowcliffe Down, Bidford and Street House here, just in other parts of, 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 of Britain. Swallowcliffe Down, I suppose, is, is, is the most beautiful of them, if you like. It's got a, a lot of information. It's got a lot of finds. Uh, there's a, the, the skeleton was largely disturbed or missing, and you can see the shadow of it there. Uh, there is a, a reconstruction of the bed on the top left-hand side there. Uh, uh, quite an elaborate affair with a, with a headboard with these uh, arched pieces of metal holding it steady. Um, there was a, a kind of sporran with a, with a disc 
a, a, um, a beautifully decorated disc on top of it. There was a, a hanging bowl and a hanging bowl with a, uh, um, this thing is, is a, it, you dip it in, put your thumb on the end and then lift it out. And you've then got a, a sprinkler. So it's a bit like um, uh, the Asperges in, in, a, in, a, in a Catholic ceremony where, where, the, where you sprinkle holy water. Uh, but this is probably sprinkling scented water. Uh, there were some little signs here, as there often is in the seventh century, of metal work relating to Christianity, but not um, uh, overt. The burial itself is very much uh, of the pagan form. And the place was called, uh, in um, folk memory, Possa's Foa, Possa's Mound. So this should be Possa. She was a female of age, age between nine, uh, 18 and 25, one put 1.6 meters high. <clears throat> Two little glass bowls were beside her on, on the bed. So this is really rather a charming vignette of somebody, a rich woman, and she's on a, in a mound um, in, at Swallowcliff Down in the, in a, on the downs there, overlooking a large piece of land. Now this one at Bidford is quite a different character, um, also a woman, also not that old, 18 to 25, about the same height, and buried with a, a very complicated series of finds, mostly very, very small. Uh, there was a sort of big bib that she wore, and on that bib were all these tiny little buckets here. Uh, Tanya Dickinson has interpreted this as being a, a cunning woman, that's to say, um, a woman who was, had religious uh, function in, in the community, um, shamaness maybe, uh, something like that. So the Scandinavians also have these people. Uh, they are very important to the community. Um, and she wore brooches and beads and so on, linen belt and a sort of special magic bag here by, by her side. Uh, so these are uh, published and um, I think uh, on, on the whole, uh, people are, are quite um, in, uh, persuaded by the in interpretation that's been given to her. Uh, Street House is an extraordinary sight. Uh, here's the plan of it. Um, I just want you to look at the map on the right hand side at the top there. Uh, Street House is uh, in North Yorkshire and it looks across the Tees to Hartlepool. Hartlepool was one of the very, very first monasteries that was um, mentioned by Bede, and it had an abbess. So Street House seems to be uh, slightly earlier, so <clears throat> it's in the seventh or seventh century. Uh, it has um, uh, two barrows here, it has a big bed burial in the middle, it has a post hole building, might be a temple, and then all these graves here are arranged like people in a, on a parade ground. Uh, and many of them, where it says F, are female. Some of them have knives, that says K. And some of them have amulets, that says A. So you can see this setup. It's a deliberate display uh, of a large number of burials, many of them female, and in the center, some alpha females buried in beds. It's hard not to think that this is a uh, some kind of a ritual center uh, and that the religion concerned is pre-Christian. And these are the important religious leaders, women in Anglo-Saxon England, as we believe, just as in Sweden, um, uh, who are also let's say uh, uh, presiding over the change to Christianity and seemingly doing it by replacing this kind of ritual site with the monastery at Hartlepool. Now, this is something's really, uh, I think it's really interesting. It's happened just in the last um, decade or so. And um, I'm now going to show you uh, how these monuments are defining the story of Britain between the fifth century and the 10th in just, um, uh, just a few pictures. So between the 5th and the 7th century, 
the Anglo-Saxons are building their burial mounds, including Sutton Hoo, but the rest of Britain are putting up incised stone monuments. Here's one from Pictland with its famous symbols, the mirror and the comb, the sword and the salmon. Uh, these are thought to be uh, represent phonemes for particular kinds of um, uh, status and um, identity, or might even be names as has been proposed. In Wales, we have standing stone incised uh, markers like at Margam here, and they're writing in Latin and also on, on, on the borders. At this time also, as well as the English settling in the southeast of the island, the Scots are uh, coming from Ireland and settling in the west part of Scotland and in the west part of Wales uh, as well. So this gives you a picture of something in, in equilibrium between two different sets of beliefs. The big change happens during the 7th to 9th century and you, you will have noticed I'm calling these periods <coughs> formative because it's a term I've robbed from the United States clearly. Uh, we have early formative, middle formative and late formative. I've called it formative because I'm really, uh, 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 most of us are a bit tired of being medieval because it's just halfway between something and something else. Uh, and I think it was much more important than that. I think basically this was the period um, in which uh, communities coalesced into recognizable entities. Well, this period saw the arrival of the monastic movement. And this very important movement is really most visible, it's mentioned by Bede, but it's most visible in its monumentality. Right up in the north, you have a Kilton, Kilton of Cadbog, this remarkable uh, cross slab here, there's a cross on the other side. Um, and then uh, this is the Irish or Scottish version uh, um, of, of a standing stone, stone cross. These little symbols here to show you the different types, but the V ones, V for victory, the grand crosses, like you see at Otley here, these are very Roman and, and, uh, and splendid. And they march across the um, uh, country to the north uh, uh, and to the west. They don't march into the English area, and the English area is remains remarkably free of uh, Christian symbolism until about 675, <clears throat> as has been shown by uh, a big uh, program of radiocarbon dating. Well, just as an aside, here is a, one of these monasteries. This is the one at Port Mahomoc. Here we are at the, uh, in the uh, Dornoch Firth, and there's the Church of St. Coleman. Uh, you see there, uh, this is the peninsula where it sits. This is Port Mahomoc here. This peninsula has views out to different seas and, and firths. Um, it has, each of these is marked by a, a large cross slab uh, here at Hilton of Cadball, Shandwick and Nick. These are very splendid monuments. They don't build barrows, they didn't build barrows then, but they did erect these other monuments which said similar things to barrows. They were landmarks and they also reported, as this symbolism seems to suggest, they see also reported something of the person who they celebrate, either in pictures, uh, but, uh, or in symbols, which are hard for us to uh, translate directly. At Port Mahomet, uh, uh, we, we dug up 230 pieces of sculpture. These are two of the biggest bits, which belong on the same um, monument. Uh, There's a splendid uh, dragon here. And um, on the other side of it, you see the apostles, amongst them St. Andrew here. So this is certainly a, a, you know, a Christian monument, but as usual at this period, with a certain hybridity, um, remembering the symbolism of the previous generation, uh, but introducing the symbolism of the new religion. <clears throat> um, it, it was an interesting site because it wasn't just a monastery, it was an elite center. Uh, oh, I can move that, good. I better move it too, up here. Um, it was an elite, elite center from sixth to seventh century, then it was a monastery, then it became a trading farm at the time of the, the Vikings, 
and then there was a long pause after it had been burnt down and uh, the church and village of the 12th and 15th century. What's really interesting about this community is that most of them, uh, until the last period, they were all locals. They adapted. <clears throat> they adapted to the politics of the age. In the 6th, 7th century, they were elite aristocrats. The 8th century, they became monks. And in many cases, the, 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 the monks were local, but there were one or two from Scandinavia, um, like uh, refugees from the Viking movement. Then the Vikings themselves came over here on the ninth century. And, and then it's this last period here where the Scots from the west of the uh, island are coming to the east and supplanting the Picts. And lastly, the late formative, 9th to 11th century, will take us back to Sutton Hoo. First of all, uh, look at all the monumentality now that there is in, in, in Britain. Now the English too are at it. They're elect, erecting monuments, but uh, not, not as fervently as the Vikings. They loved them. And they elected, uh, erected these monuments all over Yorkshire, have the cross of Christ and then the warrior uh, below the cross of Christ with his sword and shield and spear, sword and spear. <clears throat> the Hogbacks are uh, another of these interesting groups. The Hogbacks uh, start at Brompton in this area here and then go uh, up towards the north and up to the west. They seem to be a kind of warrior class. Um, who are they Viking? Are they English? Don't know. But uh, they are they are a movement. They're a movement of people who believe in much the same thing. So back to Sutton Hoo, where the last phase was a phase where the royal burial ground was used as a place of execution, and a lot of these uh, burials we, we we excavated and dated. They date from the eighth to the tenth century. Um, there's a picture there from Claudius B four, which shows a hanging in progress. It's actually um, the story of the of the baker from uh, uh, from the Bible um, and this um, uh, the, the way that these um, people were buried, as I mentioned in my previous tour, uh, showed that they'd been hands were tied and the feet were tied and uh, they'd been hanged. So this map of the area shows um, where it says Mathers Ho, that's um, uh, Sutton Hoo, and then up here by the Wilford Bridge, there's the medieval gallows there. Gallows, Gallow Hill, it's called. You can actually see the gallows there. The work that's been published is Reynolds, is Andrew Reynolds' is Anglo-Saxon Deviant Burial Customs, actually excellent book published by OUP. And this map here shows the people who were at it. Again, very much confined to the English area of Britain. So we have, uh, by the middle of the 8th century, we have kingdoms uh, either Pictish or Scottish or British or Anglian or Saxon in the island. They've settled down to a, a sort of equilibrium. Um, in, um, uh, there is a model which suggests that they are getting, some are getting bigger and richer and some are not getting so big and rich, but uh, as they keep fighting each other. But I wanted to mention this rather interesting book uh, by Ioni and uh, Opie, uh, that the uh, children's truce terms. What they wrote was a book called The Language and Law of School Children. They wrote it after the war and before television had sort of uh, smoothed out the, uh, the, co the population of children. These are the terms used in the children's um, school playground uh, to stop other children jumping on you. So the posh children said Pax uh, uh, because they were doing Latin, but most of the children use these terms in, in the Scottish area, keys, in the Pictish area uh, and the British area, barley. And then these are the different uh, things used in the different English kingdoms. It's, this is dated to about 1950. I, 
I think this is a fantastic survival, uh, I, I believe it, uh, of the personality of these kingdoms. Um, there is, there has been some work on the, on the dialects as well to see how well they've survived, but that's a lot less convincing than the testimony of the children's playgrounds. Well, other lines of research, religious conversion, here we are yelling, uh, burial mounds to the 10th century, uh, famous rune stones there. Uh, one side of the rune stone here is the Danish dragon conquering the Norwegian snake, and the other side is Christ as Odin. And Harold Bluetooth uh, is uh, recorded as erecting the stone in, in memory of his mother and father, and he conquered all Denmark and Norway and made the Danes Christians. Uh, in Norway, <clears throat> we get some very important evidence on what mounds actually did after they were built. This is the Oseberg ship burial under excavation in 1904. Fantastic photograph, high quality. And there's the ship sticking up. It was extremely well preserved, as you can see. It's all, it's, you can see all the carving on the, on the stem there. So this is a marvelous burial, burial of a woman. And um, it's been, uh, looked at again, it was uh, an early excavation, of course, but um, Jan Bill, uh, um, Asia Daly have been looking at the, uh, the, the spades that were found in the burial and assumed, I think, correct, well, it, it was absolutely correct, that they were from the robbers of the, of the uh, burial chamber. So the burial chamber was broken into and the bones of the woman and her companion were sort of scattered outside uh, outside the mound. <clears throat> this was all found during the 1904 excavations, uh, but now the dendro dates have shown that the spades are uh, dated a, a century or so later in the 10th century, roughly at the time of Harold Bluetooth when he was dominating Norway. So we can see from this that a monumental mound uh, continues in the landscape, continues to be important, continues to be known, the person in the mound is known and often gets their name, as in Orzeberg, which is Orza's mound. So these mounds continued, if you like, to influence the history of the place. Well, now, finally, we're going to move to Sutton Hoo's contacts. Uh, they were very much, um, we saw them in the burial chamber of Mound One. This is a map showing where all the different finds from Mound One came. Seventh century then, East Anglia, a little place on the edge of Europe has contacts in Scandinavia, in France, where the coins came from, in Rome, where the textiles came from, in Istanbul or Constantinople, where the silver came from. Uh, there was a yellow cloak from Syria and a hanging bowl from the Coptic area. All these found their way into the Mound One to. So we can assume that there was traveling going on. Um, in the North Sea, the uh, system, climatic system, a home blowing wind system, really favored uh, the Vikings, as you can see from this map with the wind roses. Um, in the summer, it favors people coming from Norway, and in the autumn, it favors people going back. And so these are parts of the study which show the kind of seascape which our early seafarers were coping with. Anglo-Saxon seafaring is still a, 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 a subject about which we know very little, but it's obviously it was an amazingly important to them. The ship was the most important machine in their lives. So we're asking, what was this particular ship for? Where did it go? And how did it manage to, to navigate the sea and the rivers? Well, here's some of the ancestors. New Dam, fourth century, Karlsund is uh, seventh, and Oseberg, a uh, beautiful ship of the early ninth century. These have been studied and several have been reconstructed. Uh, Oseberg reconstruction went by the name of Edda and it went on a famous voyage. This is the voyage of the Edda in 1988. Um, 
it was basically, uh, first of all, we had to test whether it could row, and it did that all right. Then could it sail? Well, it definitely had a footing for a mast, so it had a sail. Uh, the rigging was a little bit speculative and conjectural, but there was evidence for it. And we, the next thing was to try and see what happened when we put the sail up. The answer was that this little ship, uh, it, it took off at a, literally a rate of knots, like, it was like a leaf blowing over a pond at immense speed. Really exciting ride, but in this case ended in disaster because um, uh, trying to steady the ship, you can imagine what happens when the wind blows sideways, the boat starts to tip over and it looks so like it's going to uh, capsize. So you have to try and adjust the sail uh, by letting go of the sheet to spill the wind out and that keeps you from falling over. But don't forget, they have no keel, these boats. Uh, so it uh, started to go over. There is, is um, uh, that's me, and uh, this is the boat sinking. And this is a typical piece of Norwegian humor. Our best wishes for your next trip by Viking ship, says Sigbjorn. And then at the bottom here, you see two pictures, which are uh, uh, sad. Um, but uh, how many places, how many wrecks like this must have happened? How many unknown wrecks must have happened? It doesn't take much of a mistake uh, to put one of these ships upside down in the water. Well, you may wonder then why we are building a replica ship of Mound One. <clears throat> it's being done here in Woodbridge. And then uh, you can see this is the uh, area of the of all where all the yachts are and the houseboats and so on. And beyond the trees in the distance there is the Sutton Hoo site with its with its burial mound. And here is uh, the ship's company at work. Uh, basically, it's a, a small uh, charity um, uh, of about uh, five or six people. And it's now got 260 volunteers who are helping us build, build the boat. Uh, we've been supplied with oak by a lot of uh, generous people. And we've been trying to... <laughs> Martin, I think we've lost your sound. Ready? Yes, yeah, we lost your sound and we're hearing something else. Oh. Now, now I can hear you again, but oh. uh, for oh, a while there I was hearing something else. Well, I'm, what I'm hoping you were hearing, but I may be wrong, was the people cheering. Uh, oh. <laughs> as, 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 the, as this, well, this log was being split, there was oh, okay. a noise of somebody hammering it. <laughs> and then um, uh, the people cheered when it um, when it's when, when it opened up, and uh, that that was the first it's, that was the first split. Okay. Of course, it's going to be split many more times than that, and made into planks. So this is one of our um, prototypes, the Say Wolfing, Edwin Gifford's half-size reconstruction, just showing that it can sail. We're going to sail it too. We're going to sail our full-size one. We're going to take it exploring. Uh, we're going to give, try it on portage. We're going to try it on rowing and towing. This is the Cramp Macken, which is a, uh, it was a Gotland uh, 13th century um, ship. And here it is on the uh, level crossing with a train coming. That's the sort of thing you have to put up with, this kind of thing. They took this ship all the way to Constantinople or Istanbul as it is now to show that it could be done. Well, our setup is the ship's company. Uh, as I say, it's a charity. Um, the ship is going to look like the CGI reconstruction on the left. And if you're a, a seagull overhead, you should see something like the CGI reconstruction of the rowing boat on the, on, on the right there. Uh, I hope you will have a chance uh, to visit our website, saxonship.org there. That'll show the, uh, the kind of activity it has a it has a, a, a newsletter. Um, they're, they're a very jolly lot. And uh, from this summer, we'll be starting to put the planking in place. I should think it'll take another year or so, and then the trials should begin uh, around about 2022, 2023. 
I hope some of you will be able to to join us and, and see the ship in action and uh, by all means come and volunteer as well. And so all right, that's me trying to change the trying to go one forward all right like this. There we go. So Sutton who still has um, uh, quite a kudos. It's got, has had wonderful patrons. Duke of Edinburgh, David Attenborough, Seamus Healy opened the, oh, the uh, museum. Um, a lot of people have helped us um, with this research and they still are. And perhaps most importantly, the local people of, of Woodbridge. So, it's a site that's still being investigated. Sutton Who is a live project. Uh, the adventure is far from over. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Martin. That was wonderful. Um, and we have lots of questions. Um, I'm not sure we can answer them all, but um, let's start with a, with a few. Um, so several people actually wanted to know um, we're, we're curious about that hoard, as was I, that you talked about the King's Ransom hoard. Yes. So, um, so Brent Lichtenberg wanted to know, um, uh, he, was, he was puzzled by the fact that it was composed of the sword pummels and other decorative bits of, you know, uh, horse material or bridle yeah. and so on. Was this common among ransoms? He always thought it was just gold bars or gold coins that we used to pay them rather than, than these more personal items that obviously would have been gathered from people. Well, I think one has to entertain conjecture at this point. Uh, we don't know what a ransom looked like. We know what its value was. Mm -hmm. uh, so 30,000 silver coins, which is equivalent to a thousand mancus, that's, that is a, a, a statement. Of, it, it's not always the same. Uh, and of course, the ransom uh, or, or compensation varies with the Virgils, the, the amount that the individual is priced. So if you go and murder somebody's um, uh, slave uh, or murder their father, the, the price is different and it's paid at the grave. That's how Virgil works. So we're looking for something which result, which is a compensation and uh, that was what a ransom should look like, but we've never seen one. And we may not be looking at one now. I think if you look at the, the, the book on the Staffordshire Horde, it's a quite a large book, uh, uh, quite a lot, lot of detail. They've worked out what every single one of these 4,000 fragments actually came from in the first place. So all I did really was sketch a picture on why this bullion was, collect, was collected together. Right, right. And then, so wait a minute, there are two things. One is, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Because we oh, want, yes. people no. have been very complimentary in the chat and um, we're trying to encourage them actually. Kelsey, if you can put on the text to donate screen, that would be great. Um, so great. we do encourage people, if you enjoy this lecture to text give to the number that's on the screen or go to our website so we can continue doing these starting in the fall again. Um, but my other question related to that hoard is, why is it buried? I mean, because the story you give us is that they, they tried to give it to King Penda to buy him off and he stupidly didn't take it because he got defeated. But um, it, 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 why is it then buried? I mean, wouldn't you think that they would actually use it for other, another purpose? That's, that's a little confusing to me. Well, I, I imagine that it's, it's pure imagination, but in order to uh, bribe Penda to go away and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and declare peace, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the treasure would have to be delivered and weighed and so it would have to be taken to Mercia and oh. then it, they, they, he would have to say, Pender would have to say, uh, it's not enough or it's fine. Mm -hmm. And we, we know only a little bit about which, they obviously didn't use kilograms, but I'm using the kilogram purely as, a, as a, uh, a, an equivalence. The equivalence is through the grain. The, the grain is a measure that is known uh, it has metric and it also has uh, old uh, English uh, equivalences. Right. Okay. So I think I think really, uh, you know, it, it must be uh, must be considered to be highly conjectural. Uh, but I don't think anybody's come up with anything better 
as mm -hmm. conjectural people often say. <laughs> okay, okay, no, that's great. So, so there were two, a couple questions actually about Sutton Who, the material at Sutton Who. One person, Johan, wanted to know, weren't the pink garnets in the ship burial at Sutton Who from Sri Lanka? Because you mentioned a lot of things in the Mediterranean, yeah. but not anything that far afield. And then someone else wanted to know if the gold was from mines in the UK. Well, uh, we don't know the answer to that last one. And almost okay. certainly the gold was from Roman gold coins that have been melted down. Melted down. Okay. They'd had quite a long um, recycling history, if you like. The garnets do seem to have their origin sort of in Afghanistan, I think was, was, was the, the theory. Okay. Um, I think our science is getting better all the time and, and to locate these things is now becoming a little bit more possible. Um, I, I should just mention in parentheses that recently a piece of a very interesting piece of work was done, which recognized uh, a couple of lumps uh, that were in the Sutton Hoo collection of the British Museum as bitumen, actually bitumen from uh, the area of Iraq. Mm. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, some people got around, but don't forget that in the seventh century, we're very soon in the era of um, Islam and they were. Uh, had an enormous network stretching from east to west. Mm -hmm. and I suppose all I was saying was, yes, but they didn't, uh, they didn't create the whole thing. It was even before the English became Christian, they did have some kind of, of um, network. And I, that's why I think that uh, ship we're building would have gone to these different places. They wouldn't have got to Sri Lanka. They wouldn't have got to Afghanistan, but all the same merchants would and they'd know they'd get a good price. Right. Um, so since you just mentioned the ship, um, Cashman wanted to know, was the sale in the, uh, for the Ida in 1988, was that made from woven wool? Which, I mean, what was the material of the sale originally? Because uh, Cashman says it would have been wool originally. Yes. And what did you do or what did they do? I mean, I, obviously you I were think there. I wasn't involved. It was made in Norway, the ship and the sale. and. Uh, uh, Jan Gordal was the was the uh, brains behind that. I, I believe it was a worst dead wool, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the I think the stays were horsehair. That's the ropes holding the mast steady. They were horsehair. Okay. So other yeah, other questions about the ship. Since you mentioned there was no keel, um, mm -hmm. Leslie Taylor wants to know: Did they have stones in the bottom to compensate for the lack of a keel? And then what about the mast? Several people actually, uh, uh, Robert Donahue says his Danish mother wants to know, was there a mast in the Sutton Who uh, ship, the, the main burial? Right well, about? just to deal with Oseberg first, okay. that uh, did have evidence for a mast. Mm -hmm. uh, it also had other bits and pieces. It had, uh, it had these forked poles, which uh, they, uh, the Norwegians interpreted as something to hold the throat of the sail out. And when they bound it into the middle, you had a kind of billowing jib and a billowing mainsail, do you see what I mean? And that, and that was to see whether they could tack. As you see, we didn't make a very good job of it, but just because <laughs> we couldn't tack, it doesn't mean they didn't tack. And right. this is an enormously important piece of research because if uh, a Viking ship can tack, then you can put in it, uh, warriors and also later cargo. If it can't tack, you need enough rowers to get you out of trouble and you need relief rowers as well. So you need a lot of people who aren't necessarily fighters. So, so I do think it's a, a very important uh, aspect. At the moment, uh, we can say we haven't brought it off, but um, uh, the Norwegians, I'm sure, are continuing and so are the Danes. They have a very good life of building this revolution. Mm -hmm. As, so as, just and sail and the horsehair stays, I think, are the two. Okay, okay, great. Um, so, and obviously, as you, since you're now taking over that project at Woodbridge, um, obviously, you will, you will be able to experiment a little bit, too, once you actually get that done, which will be really interesting to watch. Um, so several people were really interested in, uh, obviously, the landowner females, and I, I was struck by how young they were, um, the, the examples that you showed us. Um, so uh, Derek wanted to know what accounts for the rise of alpha females and, uh, you know, we don't hear so much about these women. I mean, you mentioned abbesses, but 
Can you talk a little bit more about it? You have the cunning woman, but there are other examples that are that don't seem to fall into that category, do they? Well, as as many things in archaeology, these women declared themselves. They drew attention to themselves, even if no one was interested, which of course <laughs> very quickly were. Yes. Um, we knew we had uh, important female burials in the sixth century because they carried large uh, square-headed brooches, very ornamental gilt brooches. And in some places like Wasperton, uh, th these uh, women were buried in burial mounds, small burial mounds, even then in the sixth century. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, uh, there was quite a long, uh, there's a strong feeling, let's say, of uh, powerful women all the way through the sixth into the seventh century. Now, in the seventh century, of course, the warrior class became quite important, if, if for nothing else, as I tried to show in that map, because the kingdoms were warring. Mm -hmm. And they put their faith in, first of all, in the warrior, and secondly, in the warrior's religion, whatever that was. Mm. And as somebody has said, the reason for Sutton Who is that they were investing in the good luck given by the gods, given by Woden and the other gods. That's what they were investing. So, but that um, period then gave way to another uh, a time where the pressure was coming from Kent, particularly, and also from across the channel to convert to Christianity. The rest of the island was nominally Christian already because it had been Christian since Roman times, mm. although it was a, a special sort of British Christianity, but they were Christian. Mm -hmm. So the pressure was on uh, was on the English, and so they had to adjust in in some way. Well, if you then um, uh, just nip over to Scandinavia, and particularly to Sweden, you can see there the important role that women had. Firstly, as shamans, and secondly, in the conversion process. So, in other words, they weren't belligerent anti-Christian shamans. They were sort of managers of religious change. This is, uh, I, I'm now um, talking about the uh, Swedish scholars' ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see some of it in their rune stones, uh, where the rune stone is very much dedicated to landowning, landowning women. And in, in one case, landowning women uh, putting a memorial up to her daughter, who would be her successor in the, in the owning of the land. I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities here. If you can imagine a Viking um, community, the Vikings are away all summer. Yes. And so naturally the women get together and uh, it still happens. They go to summer farms and make butter and cheese and things like that. And so there is a, um, a, a camaraderie developing there just as there is in the boats with the, with the Viking men. I, I, in other words, I don't, I don't think this ought to surprise us. I think it should be uh, very much I think it's worth bringing attention to it, but I think it should be very much in the spirit of the uh, Germanic peoples in the in the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth century. So we started to find these bed burials because, uh, particularly Swallowcliff Down, that was about the first one, had these very puzzling bits of metal, and it took some time to work out what these what these were, and uh, the excavator worked out what they were and reconstructed a bed. And then beds started popping up all over the place because all you needed was that particular kind of metalwork, um, little hooks and eyes and rings and these and these hoops which uh, held the bed, uh, uh, you know, the, the head head headboard in position. So th therefore, there's quite a lot now. And uh, what Helena Hamro did was to get together uh, all, all of them, look at their grave goods very carefully. Notice that there was a, a bit of hybridity there. There was a, it's essentially a pagan burial rite, but they the the women often had uh, pendants with uh, crosses and so on. And so this uh, she wanted to emphasise the idea of landowning, because the burial mounds themselves were placed on um, the the top of a slope look, overlooking land, mm -hmm. and um, others, including me, have, have emphasised their. Uh, their, their control, their sort of supervision of religious change. And instead of it being, being a, something very aggressive, uh, that, that it could be done um, by... Uh, so the women who were cunning women, 
uh, were worried, quite rightly, about losing their status because uh, Christianity is quite a male sort of religion. You know, the priests are male. And uh, they did, in the first instance, have very successfully uh, a sort of transfer to lead the new monasteries, the abbesses. So a number of the new monasteries were nunneries, so to speak, mm -hmm. and some of them were mixed uh, uh, as well. So it's a very interesting period, much studied by Rosemary Cramp, um, uh, now 90 and not very well, I'm afraid, but uh, she's, she's the one who has provided uh, this, this, this wonderful, invisible group of powerful. Yes, yeah, this is amazing. I mean, all, all you, what, you know, making us think about what happened when the Viking men raided, you know, what happened back home and, and also what is happening also in the UK. So um, a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll probably have to let you go. But um, a number of people were, were really sort of puzzled by the execution mounds, you know, for the gallows um, that at Sutton Hoo. Um, and one person was, was uh, surprised that they would turn the pagan burial ground for kings into an execution site. So can you talk about that a little bit? I know you talked about it a little bit last time. Um, and then, then someone else mentioned, I'm just gonna add a second question because this is gonna be a last one, I think, um, about that mounds being used as moot hills. And I don't know actually what moot hills are. So I'm just repeating the question. Yes, well, the first uh, question is a very good question. There are two groups of uh, burials with um, where people had been executed by hanging. So those, those are the facts. Uh, there are one, is around Mound 5, and that's to say the mound that uh, was one of the earliest mound, maybe the earliest mound in the Royal Burial Ground, mm -hmm. uh, but not on it. Uh, they were buried around it. So they were buried around, for example, some of them were dug into the quarry pits of, of Mound 5. So maybe the gallows was on top of that mound because they ringing it. Then the other one was by a track uh, and that had uh, a gallows setting, which we excavated. Uh, there was a big tree pit and then there were four post holes, uh, very big post holes, su suggesting that some sort of wooden apparatus had been erected and so on. Then we carbon dated them to give them a context. When, it, when, it first, when they were first found, we had a marvellous session on ANSACs. I don't know whether anyone remembers ANSACs, but it was a chat line for Anglo-Saxonists in the United States. States, and there was a there was a lot of discussion about how how could they do this, and uh, well, uh, that was before Andrew Reynolds wrote his thesis, where he showed that all over uh, the English part of Britain, in the tenth uh, century, there were these execution places. Very often, they were sited on previous prehistoric monuments or previous mounds. They were meant to be uh, deterrents. They were meant to be to deter criminal activity, or in this case, I think more likely a non-conformity. But I very much, I, I strongly recommend you, Andrew's book to you, Anglo-Saxon uh, Deviant Burial Customs. It's, it's a lovely piece of work and very interesting and a very large number of burials that were collected by him as well as Sutton Hoo there. So the second question was about, are the mounds used as moot hills? Well, extremely good question and I think this is something that has been demonstrated in Scotland strangely enough by place name evidence that they did use some burial mounds as uh, meeting places or assembly places and um, we don't know about Sutton Hoo because they'd all been rather ploughed down so there wasn't any way of knowing what had happened on on top of them but I showed you the case of Oseberg, where the mound had stayed in the landscape and its importance had stayed, so very likely used as a, as a thing, as, a, as an assembly place. Uh, and then exploring further afield in Japan, uh, they have, uh, as you know, enormously long mounds, uh, two, three hundred meters long, which are terraced for people to stand on. And uh, they leave offerings on the terraces and the burials are right at one end, it's rather like uh, in, in a, a, um, a pop concert, there's, a, there's, a, there's the, the band is on circular bit right at the end and all the other people are in the, in, in the auditorium, so to speak. 
uh, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing. And the burials were uh, are, uh, made after the mound, so they were dug into the top of the mound. So the mound was already used as an assembly place. Um, uh, so that's, I think that's a particularly interesting example. Cahokia, I think, probably has a similar uh, storyline to it. I, I, I looked at Tim Pakutat's uh, book, of course, and, and, and met him and, and was shown around a terrific day we had uh, looking around. And there, that, that mound, the big one there, has enormous prominence, the, the monk mound. It has wonderful prominence. So I'm quite sure things happened on top of it. So yes, I think wherever there's a high place, people meet, and they particularly meet if they want everybody to agree to the decision that they're about to make. <laughs> right, right. So uh, one last question, which I think is also a great one. What language did they speak? Um, well, the people of Sutton Hoo were, were yeah. speaking uh, Anglo-Saxon or Anglian, the Anglian version of Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes to... Um, there, there is some, um, the same language that uh, Bede used in his Anglo-Saxon world, with the Anglo-Saxon translation of his book, uh, that, that was Northumbrian. So there, there was kind of variations in the dialect. It's really Old English. It's Old English and it's Old English in its most sort of primitive form. And then it, oh, the Old English we know better, that is the one in the poetry and the riddles and the Anglo-Saxon chronicle and so on, that, that, comes, that comes a bit later on. So we would love to be a fly on the wall and, and, and uh, hear what they said. And many people have, 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 have tried. In fact, typically there's a, a bit of a confrontation about the correct way to pronounce certain names in, in Anglo-Saxon. Uh, but again, that's a sort of experimental literature, rather like uh, experimental archaeology. People are given to going up to the top of Mound One, as it is now, and proclaiming uh, Beowulf in Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> and uh, it's quite easy to understand sometimes, and sometimes it's much harder. If you know German as well, then it's quite easy. In our ship, we're going to name it, we don't know, we haven't agreed yet, but we don't know Redwell's queen's name, but she's the one who deserves to have her name on it. So it'll probably be something like Ost Angliquen, uh, East Angles Queen, or yeah. the East Anglian Queen. And uh, we'll put it on in English and in Anglo-Saxon and in runes as well. Lovely. Well, that's a lovely note to end on. Martin, huge numbers of appreciations in the chat from everyone who attended. Everyone really enjoyed this. It's a wonderful end to our year-long series here. Uh, if the people are still here uh, who are listening, we really would appreciate it if you would donate whatever you feel comfortable doing so we can continue this type of programming. Uh, there's a text to give on the screen and there's also our website, archeological.org slash donate. Thank you again, Martin, so much. And thank you all for attending. Um, and take care, have a wonderful summer, everyone. Bye.